morning. And we want to be a blessing to you this morning. And also throughout the service, if you want to send in your prayer requests, please send them to us. And we will be praying for them all the time. And we do, I want to open up with a word of scripture. And it says in Romans 8, 35, 37, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Amen? Hallelujah. We just want to encourage you with the truth. And the truth we find is in the word of God. And to not allow fear to govern your hearts and your minds and your souls, but to walk in faith and to know that nothing, nothing will ever separate us from the love of God. And we want to reach out to the community. We want, this is a time that we can reach out to our, our friends and our loved ones and be that encourager to them and pray for them. And you know, God has brought us together, together to love one another. Oh, my God. 
Amen. So I just want to encourage you, you know, it's really not about the video. It's about the message that's in the video. So even if you have to just listen, then I just pray that you continue to tune in. And if you have your Bibles with you this morning, uh, I would ask that you turn your Bibles over to Mark chapter 6, verse 45 is where we're going to begin. And you know, I was looking at something this morning, and I've been noticing for the past maybe week and a half, uh, maybe even a little bit more, that a lot of what's coming out on the news and the media is how many people are affected by the virus around the world. How many deaths there are, how many new cases there are. But for some reason, they're not talking about the people that have come over it. So I looked this morning uh, at the latest numbers uh, from John Hopkins University, which is what they're using right now for the information. And it said that as of today, 614,880 cases of COVID-19 have been discovered worldwide. Approximately 100,000 of those people have been delivered from the COVID-19 virus. So I wanna encourage you, starting off with just that this morning, that it is not something like the bubonic plague, influenza of 1918, where millions upon millions of people uh, are dying from it. They're coming up with more uh, antidotes as we speak. So be encouraged this morning, church, that we will get past this, amen? And I wanna read to you this morning concerning Jesus walking on the sea. You know, a lot of times we forget that God still works miracles today. He is the same God from yesterday, today, and forever, and continues to do miracles all the time. And because we don't always proclaim those miracles, doesn't mean that He's not working miracles in our lives. I believe that some of you are being forced to be at home with your spouses this morning so that you can get along just a little bit better. Some of you are spending more time with your children than ever before because you work a lot of hours. And there's been this gap there between you and your children or family members. And now you're having dinners together and you're learning about each other's lives. You're more involved now. You see, God will work all things for the good for those who love Him. Amen? And so I believe that this morning. And if you have turned your Bibles over to Mark chapter 6, verse 45... I'm going to read a short story here on what's taking place here with the, the disciples being in the boat. And in verse 45, the Word of God reads, Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat. Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he sent the multitude away. And when he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. Now when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. So he was, he quarantined himself. Amen. He got away to talk to God, to speak to God. Then he saw them straining and rowing, for the wind was against them. Now about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea, and would have passed them by. And when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost and cried out. For they all saw him and were troubled. But immediately he talked with them and said, Be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. Then he went up to the boat to them, and the wind ceased. And they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and marveled. For they did not understand about, for they had not understood about the loaves, because their hearts were hardened. When they had crossed over, they came to the land of Genesaret and anchored there. And when they came out of the boat, immediately the people recognized him. Let's pray this morning. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask that you would anoint this word, anoint this message, anoint the ears of the listeners this morning, soften the hard hearts, Lord God, I pray. Let our hearts be fertile ground this morning, Father. We ask it in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. So what's taking place here is this was a very busy day for Jesus. It was a very busy day for the disciples. You see, they ministered to crowds all day long. Jesus had taught them the word. And late in the afternoon time came, Jesus manifested his power and fed 15 to 20,000 people 
with just a couple of loaves and a couple of fish. Evening is coming up fast. Jesus sends away his men by a boat to the other side of the lake. So he did this for some reasons. Okay, first had to do with the crowds that Jesus had fed. And you can read about it in John chapter 16. And it tells us that the people were so excited by the miracle of bread and fish that they tried to make Jesus their king. Now they tried to make Jesus their king because if you're an emotional type person and Jesus has just done something for you, you get excited about it. You want to lift him up. But the only reason why they were excited is because he had just fed them. He had just given them something to eat. What would happen if they would have gotten hungry again? They would have started murmuring. They would have started complaining again. You see, we need to be the types of people that whether we have plenty or in want, we know that God will supply all our needs according to His riches, according to His glory. Sometimes we even vote what president will give us the most money. Amen? So we're not a whole lot different than these people here. Another reason why Jesus sent the disciples away was so that he could spend time alone with his Father. He sensed change in the direction of his ministry. And we can see this now as preachers, as ministers of the gospel, that there's a shifting taking place right now. You know, God told me some time ago that the church was going to grow. I look now to a group of people, a skeleton crew, of when it first, uh, we first started Breakthrough Community Church in the backyard with approximately 12, 13 people. It's a little, little bit what we have like right now. And it reminds me of God's faithfulness. But the one thing that has grown is the people that are viewing online now. You see, we can think that God is saying one thing, but He's saying something else. We didn't have any idea that our online views would grow so much. But you know what, if you're watching out there right now, know that the Holy Spirit can work through a video. Because God's word will not come back void. And if you're watching right now, I want you to pay attention to what's taking place around the world. To tune in to what God is trying to tell you. He can reach you in your home. He can reach you in your sofa. He can reach you on your bed. He can reach you in your yard. God is faithful. And he can find you wherever you're at. They were in a boat. Where are you at this morning where he's trying to reach you? You've stopped going to church. It hasn't been a priority. But I want to tell you, God is calling the backslider home. He is calling you back to receive him once again. To come back to the love that you once had for him. You used to get excited. You never missed the service. And now God has brought service to you. Just like he walked towards the disciples... He will go to you and meet you wherever you're at this morning. He wanted to spend time alone with his Father. This is a lesson for us to pray, to seek the Lord's help at every turn of roads in life that we have. You know, this morning I was looking at announcements from the 11th of this month. And we had all kinds of events going on and picnics and gatherings and discipleships and all types of things. And look at how much things have changed in 14, 15 days. The earth has been shaken in a short amount of time. And for many, they think that the end is near. We've been preaching that the end is near for many, many years since before I was even born. We're even nearer now, church people, than we ever were before. As I was driving up the freeway this morning, early this morning, I looked at how dead the roads were. Not because it was a Sunday, because I drive every Sunday, approximately at the same time to come here, turn on the lights and check the church out. And I saw how much less people there were out. And you know what it reminded me of? It reminded me of maybe what the earth is going to look like after we're raptured, after we're taken up. And what people are going to be thinking, where did everybody go? What calamities are going to take place as believers that are pilots, driving uh, diesels, what they're going to see when we're gone? It reminded me of an apocalyptic time because we are living in the last days. 
We're only seeing small glimpses right now. These are small portraits of what's to come. And I want to remind you to stand on guard at all times. Stand your ground and stand your post until the Lord comes back home for His bride. You see, when this miracle is being preached, Jesus was also trying to uh, minister to the disciples. You see, that was another reason that He sent them away. Because they had just seen the miracles of God, and they were still filled with doubts. They were still filled with unbelief. And so He sends them to a storm. <clears throat> Did He know there was a storm? Of course He knew there was a storm. He sent them to it because they still had doubts in their heart. Do people feel like they're in a storm now? Yes, they do. Some people, from what I understand, have already started committing suicide because they don't want to see what's to come. It's almost like the Great Depression in the 1920s where people were just jumping out of buildings. People are doing these things because they have no hope. But I want to tell you this morning, the blessed hope is still here for you. He's still here for you. When this miracle is preached, the emphasis is always placed on the storm. And we love as preachers to preach about uh, you know, how Jesus helps the hurting people in the midst of storms. But I want to tell you something here this morning. That if you preach to hurting people, you will always have an audience. You will always have a congregation. Always. The sick, you will always have with you. The lame, you will always have with you. The faithless, you will always have with you. Well, that's in, uh, one possible application for this pa passage. It's not the only one that it suggests. <clears throat> There's another interpretation. I think when I start, don't worry, I don't have anything. That's just me screaming and yelling. <laughs> Amen? Amen. I feel like I have to explain myself now, even if I go get gas or something. You know, you cough, you have the sniffles or anything like that. People look at you like, you know... You're like, what are you doing here? Get away. Um, so what I want to do is I want to show you, and if you want to put a title to the message, you can place on the title uh, a portraits, portraits in the storm. Kind of like picture mentality, you know, of what's happening here and how Jesus deals with being in the midst of a storm. Because many of us think that this is a storm that we're in. And for some it is. It's bringing them to a realization that they never thought about. We have to think about the times that we are in. We are in the last days. Know that. So what Jesus does here is I want to show you <clears throat> a picture for the burden. Are you burdened this morning? For some, there's a lot of burdens. Will my child get sick if I send them out? Will my family get sick if we go to the grocery store? We have many burdens because uh, you can see the domino effect taking place. The domino effect is taking place with losing jobs, finances, security that we thought would be there forever and ever. And those securities are gone now. But I want to tell you that your job is not your provider. Jesus is your provider. Amen? Amen. Amen. There's a great word of comfort here for those going through the storms of life. So I can almost guarantee that you will fall into one of these three categories. You're either in a storm, coming out of a storm, or you're headed to a storm. There's physical storms, mental storms, emotional storms, spiritual storms, storms in homes, storms in marriages, storms at work, storms at church. And some storms are just being human. Amen? I know right now, I, I almost feel really, really bad for people that are sick with just the normal flu, or people that have just a cough because they, they have allergies, you know, I have allergies, and so every once in a while I'll get a tickle in my throat knowing that it's my allergies, and before my, my, my medication kicks in for my allergies, you know, I'm like, well, I can't go to the store until this, this thing kicks in here, otherwise people are going to look at me weird. But I want to encourage you this morning that Jesus is over all these things. So, a storm can be part of the human experience. A storm touches every part of our lives. We find ourselves in stormy situations from time to time. 
But Jesus gives us hope. Now, I want you to pay attention to this story. He sent them constrained. The Bible says here that he sent them constrained. So in other words, he made them get on the boat. He didn't ask them. This word means to drive or to force. He didn't give them the option. He told them, get on the boat. They didn't want to go. And he basically literally pushed them onto the boat. He knew a storm was coming. He knew that he was going to send them in the midst of it. Just like now. If you don't think he knows what's going on now, then you're mistaken. Just like he did with Job. He allowed certain things to take place so that he could get closer. What you need, need to remember today is that as we face this, these stormy times, is that when God stands behind us, and we have to remember who it is that's behind us, that gives us the power to go forward. If we're in a storm, it's because the Lord has allowed us to go into it. Now, I know some of us may have a hard time with that. But I'll tell you, <clears throat> with personal experience, that in those times of storms in my personal life, is when I've learned the greatest life lessons that I needed to learn as a man, as a husband, and as a father. To remember what things are important to me and what things are important to God. If just one area of our lives is outside His control today, then we're in a serious uh, amount of trouble. You see, He wants us to, to be well-rounded. And if we have trouble in our life, He wants to bring that out so that we can repent of it and He can deal with it and forgive us of it. Because He wants us to come to Him for forgiveness. You see, the Bible tells us in Romans 8.28 that all things work for the good. All things work for the good. Now, I want you to take a look, if you have your Bibles with you, in verses 46 through 48, this is how we've seen them. They were on the sea in the middle of a dark, stormy night. Jesus is miles away on a mountain, and he's praying to his Father. And the Bible says that he's seen them. Now, he's far away from what they thought. Just like you might be thinking here this morning that he's far away. But even though he was miles away from them, he still seen them. He seen them in the storm. These two, this verse here showcases the two great truths that need to be mentioned about the Lord's care for his people. First of all, his interest. Even though he was occupied with matters of eternity when he was praying to God, he still had his eyes on you. You know, the Bible says that his eye is on the sparrow. The sparrow. That he watches over the sparrow. That he makes sure that the sparrow, this little bird, is fed on a daily basis. How much more does God care for you being created in his image? Much more than the sparrow. So whatever it is that we're going through right now, this morning, yesterday, tomorrow, God is still concerned and his interests are still towards you. You see, he saw them toiling. That's what the Bible says. He's seen them toiling. You know what that word literally means? Torture. He saw them in their own torture. They were afraid for their very lives, like people are afraid today for their very lives. They feel like they're being tortured. But you know what? They were under this incredible amount of stress. The Bible says that even the wind was contrary. You know what that means? That word means, literally it means in your face. Now, wherever you go now, whatever channel you turn on now, COVID-19 is in our face. It's right there. We can't turn to anything right now. Even the shows that come out weekly, the, the, the weekly shows, they're starting to jump in on it and get in on it. So everywhere we look, everything we see has something to do with it. Signs on the freeway, postings on, on, on businesses and supermarkets, gas stations, watch out for the pumps, watch out for this, watch out for that. It's literally in our face everywhere we go. You see, they're fighting for their lives and Jesus seen it. He sees your stress. He sees your anxiety, your worry, but you know what I love that Jesus does? Is he comes to intercede. 
He comes to intercede. You see, Jesus was on that mountain, but he wasn't wasting his time. He was praying to his Father. He was praying for direction in the ministry. And I'm sure that he's praying for you now, making intercessions for you and I. You haven't been abandoned in this storm, church, people of God. For those of you that don't know God, he hasn't abandoned you. Cry out to him this morning. Call out to him this morning. I remember the day on October 16, 1993, when I called out to Jesus, asked him to forgive me of my sins, to deliver me from drug addiction and alcoholism. And he saved me on that day, a day that I'll never forget. And you can do that now. You can do that by the end of this service. We're going to have an altar call for you so that you can accept Christ. I will walk you through the sinner's prayer, the very prayer that I gave my life to Jesus. 26 years ago. If you go to verses 48 to 51, you're going to see next how he saved them. He didn't just send the men out there to die in the storm. He didn't just watch from a safe distance while they struggled. He took an active part in their rescue. You know what he did? He walked to them. Just like he's willing to do today. He will come to you. He will meet you at your very time of need, at your very place of need. Now, let's look at how he ministered to these men on this sea. He blessed them with his presence. You see, you're not left alone, people, to struggle by yourself. The Lord himself came to them just like he will to you. I think about the scene, and they're all talking, now these are, these are men. And grown men are crying out for fear of their life. And Jesus comes walking along. And we'll get into it in a second, but at first they think he's a ghost. And I'll explain that. But you know what? We can count on him. We can count on his promises. We can count on his presence as well. You see, you never will weather a storm on your own. And what he did when he walked to them was he brought them peace. And this is what many of you need right now, is the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. He brought them peace in verses 49 and 50, when the disciples seen him coming on water. They thought they were seeing a ghost or spirit, like it says in verse 49. It gives us the word that we have today, phantom, like a ghost or a spiritual apparatus. They were terrified, they cried out, in other words, they were screaming. Grown men weren't afraid to scream next to each other. That's how afraid they were. Now, if you look here, the word would have passed them by means that Jesus literally walked right up to them and was walking parallel to where they were going in the same direction. You see, these men at that time thought they were dead men. Just like many people think they are today. And that's why I wanted to encourage you with how many people have gotten over COVID-19, the coronavirus. It's because people will walk from it. People may even die from it and be raised back again by Jesus himself. Delivered, set free to never get it again. You see, Jesus sensed their distress. He seeks to comfort them. He identifies himself by saying, it is I. It is I. This right here is telling us you know, this is what's called an, an emphatic personal pronoun. In other words, he's saying the same thing when he said, I am the bread of life, I am the door, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. That's the same I he's talking about when he mentions that to them. It is I. It is the I am that stands next to you in your boat. Now, I was watching a... Uh, video and there's an app called The Chosen and as I was watching it there was one scene particularly you can download it you can watch it for free it's really good I want to encourage you to do that and there was a scene where he met the woman at the well and they're going back and forth talking and she doesn't believe who he is and he tries to tell her he said if only you knew who it was that asks you for a drink I want to encourage you right now 
if only you knew who it were that is calling and tugging at your heart right now. It is the King of Kings. It is the Lord of Lords that is tugging at your heart right now. It is Him. You see, there's no power in my words. There's only power in Christ. There's only power in His Word. And if you only knew who it is right now that is calling you by name, who's tugging at your heart street, at your heartstrings right now, who, I'm going to heal you. I'm going to deliver you. I'm going to set you free. I'm going to save you. That's the Jesus that is talking to these men here. That same Jesus, he's still a sea walking Messiah. He's still a deliverer. He's still a life changer. He's not worried about now. He's worried about forever. You're forever. And he's here for that this morning. You know, I don't know about you, but I thank God for the times that he's whispered, peace, be still. In the times where I'm freaking out about something or, or other, he will whisper in my ear, peace, love, joy. You know what I love about Jesus too? Is the power that he has. <laughs> the power that he has. You see, I had tried to stop doing a lot of the things that I was doing and couldn't do it in my own power. But until I found the power of God, actually until the power of God found me, because it wasn't me searching for him, he was searching for me. You see, God's not lost. You are. I was. And it was that day that I was found by him. Just like he wants to find you now. He's not lost. We are. His power is demonstrated in verse 51. And I'll read verse 51. Then he went up to the boat to them. And the wind ceased. He didn't even speak yet. All he did was walk up to them. Now I pictured this in my mind. And I started thinking. There's a great tempest that's going on. The wind. The water. All these things are going and you know what? Jesus, I can just imagine him still walking straight. The waves are not affecting our Messiah. He's still walking as if he's walking on cement. And they're looking at him like, why aren't the waves affecting this person coming to us? Because he wanted to display his power. You don't think he wants to display his power now? I'd say it's an opportune time if we pray as a people. If we pray as a people to show His power. Now some of us need that to believe, but I don't need that to believe. I already believe, but I know He's able. I know He's willing. I know that He wants to display His power, just like He did here. And He does. All He does is walk up to them. That once they recognize Him, boom. The sea is stopped. Yes, nature does listen to God. Nature declares His glory. That's what the Bible says. You need to know that Jesus can calm your waves, your storms. Amen? Amen? On the other hand, He might choose to do what He did with Paul. To leave you in the storm and calm the fear in your heart instead. You see, Paul, the apostle, had something that he prayed that this thorn in his side spiritual thorn in his side would leave him. And the Lord told him this, my grace is sufficient for you. Now I want to tell you an encouraging word here. That God is allowing certain things to take place in us for a reason so that we can draw closer to him. Some of us don't talk to the Lord like we used to talk to him. Some of us don't worship the Lord the way we used to worship the Lord. It's almost like we're in Laodice, Laodicean times right now in Revelation chapter 3 where it seems like it's a wake-up call for us to be able to come back to the heart of worship. To come back to where we have our first love with Him all over again. The time where anything was uh, convicting to us that did not, and we knew it did not please God. You see, sin in any shape or form should not be pleasing to us. Because it's not pleasing to God. So the first portrait was to the burdened. The next portrait is to the bride. The bride is the church. So this miracle 
paints a clear portrait of those enduring times of difficulty and pain. It also paints a portrait of the bride of Christ as she waits for her bridegroom. The bride of Christ is made up of every believer ever since Pentecost up to the rapture of the church. So if you're saved, you're part of that, the bride of Christ. Now, verse 45, how does he save the bride? You see, just as these men were constrained to get into the ship, every person who is a part of the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, is compelled or driven to him. You see, a bride is driven to the bridegroom. That's why I wanted to tell you this morning, you did not choose to serve God. He chose you. He chose you and He called you. If you're not saved here today, I want to encourage you with that, that He's calling you now. He's calling you now, right where you're at. And He wants you to be saved. He wants to spend more time with you. He wants you to know who He is. No one is saved today because they made the choice to serve Him. You can read that if you want in John chapter 15, verse 16. If you are saved here today, it's because He came to you in your dead, lost condition. You are saved because God drew you to His Son. Amen? There's plenty of uh, room, by the way, for more people to come on that great ship to Zion. You can get on board if you want today, by the end of this service. He makes that invitation to all. In verse 45, it also speaks on how He sends His bride. Just like the disciples, He started us on a journey. We're headed to the other side of the lake. We're also headed to heaven. Amen? We're heaven bound. Even as we speak right now, every day that we speak of Jesus, we talk of Him, we pray to Him, we worship Him, is a day closer that we go home to be with the Father, to be with the bridegroom. Those who know the Lord are not afraid of this world. The world stands against the bride and the bride of Christ. And sometimes it gets a little stormy, just like in any relationship. But I'll tell you one thing, that in this relationship as the bride, us, the church, it's always us that's wrong. It's not like a regular relationship. But it is also us that wander from Him. You see, everywhere you go, you look at the church of God. The true church of God is always under some type of attack. Do you see the nation of Islam under attack? Do you see Buddhism under attack? Hinduism under attack? No. You see the Bride of Christ under attack. The world hates us because He is the narrow way and we've chosen to follow Him. The world rejects Christianity because it demands a total break with sin. The world will never accept that. Will you stop sinning? No. But you have the blood of Jesus to cover you to set you free, to, to deliver you. He also sustains His bride. He keeps His bride. You see, our struggles, they don't go unnoticed by God. He is always looking. He is always watching. And Jesus sees everything that we face, and He sustains us through the storm. He will keep you in this storm. He will deliver you in this storm. He will hold you in this storm. How does He do it? He does it by His prayers. Jesus, like I've already mentioned, he intercedes for us. He sits at the right hand of the Father, interceding for His people. How else? By His presence. What, we, what may seem like dark days for the church. Now, I started looking at this whole thing in a spiritual sense. In a spiritual sense, the enemy, the world, thinks that they're keeping the church separated because you can't have ten people or more. And as I mentioned last week, the church has left the building. Because we are the church. Now we get to go out to minister this marvelous gospel where we weren't going out before. In your circle, where you're at, if you're quarantining right now, you have a captive audience, don't you? You have someone to minister to. Not only that, but you have this, the, the, the opportunity to be the example to. And that's what I want to encourage you with this morning. That God not only helps us or sustains us by His prayers, but He also does it by His presence. Are you bringing God's presence in to your circle right now? Whether you're at home, or some of you are still going to work. For those of you that are at work, what an opportune time this is to be able to minister and be a witness of this glorious gospel that we preach about. 
You see, many modern churches have gotten into this, uh, this, they've been gripped by apathy, they've been gripped by complacency, and God said, enough is enough. Amen? Enough of tickling their ears. Start talking to them about the end days. I believe we're seeing a glimpse, a very small glimpse of what's to come, as I mentioned. He has their attention now. He needs to have your attention so that you can tell them because right now they're going to look for an answer where they never were looking for an answer before. You know, I thank God for people today that are still looking for God to do something because He is. People that are looking in this whole situation with hope. These people will not be disappointed. Let me show you what Scripture says. Scripture says, where there are two or three gathered there in my name, I am in the midst of you. Does that sound like quarantining to, to you? Because it does to me. There may be only a couple of you at home and you're quarantining at home, self-quarantining at home, at work. There may be only a few of you, ten or under. But he says, all you need is two or three. And that's where I want to encourage you. That you do have an audience. And God will be looking forward to using you in this time. Where there are two or three gathered there in my name. I am in the midst of you. He's going to meet these people and he's going to bless them with his presence. You know how else he's going to bless you? He's going to bless you with his power. You see, Jesus knows how to calm the bride. Amen? Husbands, if you're out there right now, your bride, your wife, your spouse may be freaking out. It's an encouragement to you that by the power of God, He would use you to minister, to be a witness to her, to your children, to your families, your close friends, and whisper peace into them. Pray peace over them. But he didn't only come for his power. He came to calm the church as well. History has demonstrated time and time again that the Lord can give peace in a time when the church is being persecuted or separated. He did it with the disciples. He gave them peace. You know what Paul said? He said, to live is Christ and to die is gain. I have nothing to lose now that I'm saved. You see, what people fear many times is they fear death. They fear death, and if you fear death here today, it's because you're not assured of the blessed hope in your life. Don't fear death any longer. I don't fear death any longer. I used to fear death because I didn't know where I was going to go. I kind of did know where I was going to go, but I was like, well, maybe I can do a last second prayer. We don't know if that opportunity will ever come for you or for anyone else around you. So we need to make sure that we give them that blessed hope. So not only has he come to calm his church or his bride, he has the power to come for his church as well. Just like he walked on the water to come to his men in the storm, one day Jesus will come and deliver his church from this storm, from the storms of this world, like he promised. That is our hope, that he is coming soon, very soon. He has the power to carry his church. He safely delivered the disciples to their destination and the church can expect the same from Him now. He's going to take us where He wants us to go. You see, the church is not going to be destroyed. I can guarantee you that right now. The devil will not destroy the church. The rebels within the walls of the building will not destroy the church. The complacent, the lost, they will not destroy the church. The church is not going down. The church is going up. I want to encourage you with that here today. Lastly, we talked about the burden, the portrait of the burden, the portrait of the, of the bride. And now I want to talk to you about a portrait of the blind. Before I gave my life to Christ, I was blind. I couldn't see 10 feet in front of me spiritually. I didn't know what was to come. I was worried about satisfying my now. Not my tomorrow, not by tonight, or anything like that. It was, I lived for now. You see, Jesus sent his men into the storm so that he could give them a lesson in faith. Now, sometimes we're forced to have faith, and that's not a bad thing. The faith he wants you to get back to this morning are very basic. 
He wants us to get back to prayer. He wants to get us back to worship. The very basics of Christianity. We used to love talking to people about Christ and we've stopped over time. We've had some hurts in between. Some of what we think are let down. And we don't want to proclaim this message any longer. But I want to tell you, if you go back to the heart of worship, back to the heart of prayer, back to your first love, like you've never known before, Christ is faithful. That's one thing I want to tell you is this morning is that He's faithful. You see, in this marriage that we have with Him, we haven't always been faithful. But He's always been faithful. He sent them out there so that they can come to understand who He really was. In a lot of ways, the disciples were blind to the power and the person of Jesus. Just like some people are today. Well, I don't see Him. So how can I believe in Him? Will He come for those? Who want to see before they believe? Well, he, want, he will come to those who have the faith in Him. Faith means to believe the unseen. Amen? Faith means to believe what you cannot see. Someone who is higher than you, not the same as you. We trust or mistrust people because we can see them. We can see what they've done. They have a pattern of being trustworthy. Jesus, the Word of God, has a pattern of being trustworthy. Especially to His people in good times and in bad he gives us teachings of faith in verses 45 through 51. If you want to read this story afterwards, you can go back on the notes or back on this sermon. So you see, there they are out on the boat. They're terrified, fearing for their lives. And all of a sudden, Jesus shows up. He demonstrates His power, His great power over nature. To the ocean, He says, go this far and no further. Everything that grows, grows up. It grows up. Because it's declaring His glory. It worships like we should worship. With our hands raised up high. These men had all the evidence they needed to believe who Jesus said He was. Yet 11 of them did not fully comprehend who Jesus was until He died on the cross and rose again from the dead. Even without this miracle, His men should have known who Jesus was. Consider this. Look at this, what they had already seen. Now they've seen this with their own eyes. They've seen Him cast out demons. They've seen Him heal all matters of disease. Like He'll do with COVID-19. He's seen them, they've seen Him calm the storm. They, they've seen Him raise a dead girl, a dead man, from the dead, to live again. They had already seen this. They're still afraid on the boat. But yet they had just seen these miracles. They've seen many more things. They've seen Him feed thousands upon thousands of people with just a little basket of food. But you know what? We're no better than them. Because we've seen miracles in our life too. Not only have we seen miracles, we've experienced our own personal miracles. But yet we still doubt. Why? He wants to show us His power. He wants to display to us so that our faith can grow. As I ask the worship team to come up, it's time for our faith to grow. Who are you going to trust this morning? Are you going to trust Jesus? Jesus had these disciples. He's trying to show them a lesson on who He is. He's trying to show us who He is. You see, God did the same thing with Israel. All the trials they faced, the Red Sea, Egypt, hunger, thirst, enemies, and He'll do the same for His church today. You know what we have these days is we have what's called the transgression of faith. It's almost a sin to even say that we have faith when we really don't. Because our actions in our mouth, our speech, will show whether we really do have faith or not. Is that something that we need to repent of this morning? Do we have even a mustard seed sized faith this morning? I'm not saying to close our eyes at what's going on and put our head in a hole. I'm not saying that this morning. What I'm saying is to trust God fully. 
I've been seeing videos of different uh, people, and they're singing. He's got the whole world in his hands, and he does. He does. If you don't know this, you can look at science books. But if the sun was any closer, literally any closer than it is now, we'd all burn. If it was any further, we'd all freeze. And if you don't think that he has the whole world in his hands, I'm not sure what faith is. Many times our faith is way too small. We don't have what it takes. You say, I don't know enough of God's word to tell people. Well, you have your testimony of what he's delivered you from, what he set you free from. And just like he took him to the shore, he's going to take us to the shore, to safety. Throughout all of this, he's going to take us to safety. We're his bride and he loves us. He's going to accomplish his work no matter what. Are you burdened today? The Lord knows and He cares. Bring your storm to Him this morning. Let Him give you peace, the peace that you seek. Let Him bring you joy where there may be no joy. Are you part of the bride this morning? Keep looking up. Jesus is coming for His people. If you're not saved, I want to invite you this morning. If you have someone in your home right now that is not saved, Grab them. Grab them right now because we're going to do a prayer. And you can say the prayer along with them. Let's say this prayer right now so that you can accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. You won't have to worry any longer about the situation because you're going to have the peace that surpasses all understanding. Let's pray. Just repeat this after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I come before you, a sinner in need of a Savior. Jesus, I believe you died on the cross. You rose on the third day and that you live forevermore. Holy Spirit, I invite you into my heart to rule, to reign, to be my God. Forgive me of all my sin, past and present. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you said that prayer this morning, and I want you to know that the angels in heaven rejoice. Right now there's a party taking place in heaven over the one who accepted him as Savior. Father, I pray over them right now in the name of Jesus that there would be a new joy, a new peace, a refreshing going on, a victory. Father God has taken place here. What the enemy meant for evil has now been changed for good. In the mighty name of Jesus, Holy Spirit, have your way. Have your way in the households that are taking place, just like, Father, with Passover. The blood has been sprinkled already upon the doorposts. Now let it be sprinkled over their hearts, their spirits, oh God. Let them have that peace and that joy, Father, I pray. In the mighty name of Jesus. And I want you to begin to join us as we begin to sing a worship song here this morning. And that you can continue to pray over the one you led to the Lord right now. As we go ahead and sing this song this morning.
we close this morning's service, I want you to know that we truly, truly do miss all of you. Spending time with you here, our five minutes of fellowship that we have here, we miss that so much right now, very dearly. Myself, my wife, the church family. We want to make sure that we all stay safe and never for a minute think that you're alone. You can always reach us via text, telephone, Facebook, whatever means, we are here for you. And we want to make sure that you understand and know that. And I want to encourage you too, also later on, uh, very, very soon, keep an eye on our breakthrough page, my page, my wife's page, and others' pages from the church. We're going to be sending out a video. We asked some people to uh, join. We're going to do a worship song. We each had a little clip to do. And at the end, there's a little treat of all the bloopers. And so you can uh, just get some laughs about it. You know, we're not taking things lightly, but we know who our God is and we know who our church is. And, you know, we just wanted to let you know that we love you. We're praying for you right now. Just keep your eyes open for the video and I hope you're blessed by it. God bless you this morning. God loves you.